times of what we call pre-discussion, and you've been activated, and you've accessed what's called your prior knowledge. So now you should be tuned in really well and be able to focus and concentrate. And so we'll just ask Miss Abby to take a big deep breath, and everybody else take a big deep breath. <gasps> and Lord, over this note. And one more. All right, now, really so I don't want to hear any sound. Okay, now you're going to go into your most amazing listener learner mindset. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Hello, everyone, and thank you all so much for your patience while I loaded my media files. I have a couple cool pictures of astronauts and launches that I wanted to share with you, so that was important because I think that you'll really enjoy them. Uh, I heard that you guys have been learning about space, so I'm super excited, and who knows, maybe by the end you'll be able to educate me a little bit about that. Um, as you were chatting, I also heard that you had a lot of really great questions, and I'm going to ask you to hold all of those questions until the end. We will have a lot of time for questions, so please either keep the ones you had or start thinking of new ones while I talk and keep them in your mind so that we can have a discussion about them afterwards. Um, all right, so let's get started. First off, thank you all so much for having me here today. I'm really excited to be in the United Arab Emirates. This is my first time visiting this country, um, and it's especially exciting to get to talk to all of you. I hope that by sharing some of the experiences that I've had and my journey towards becoming an astronaut, I can inspire all of you to follow whatever big dreams or goals you might have for your future as well. So I wanna start off by telling you a little bit about my story, how I ended up getting interested in space, and it started when I was even younger than all of you here. Back when I was about five years old, so as long as I can remember, I've wanted to be an astronaut. As a little kid, I used to stare up at the night sky and I would look at all the constellations and the stars and the planets and I would dream about what was out there. Are there aliens? Are there other planets where maybe humans can walk and someday live? Who knows? When I was seven years old, I started to take imaginary journeys through the cosmos where I would pretend that I was going to space. And when I was 10, I read every science fiction book about space travel that I could get my hands on. When I was 13 years old, so I'm growing up here, these dreams started to become realities when I went down and saw my first launch in person, which was STS-134 Space Shuttle Endeavor. Who here knows what uh, the space shuttle program was? Raise your hands if you do. All right, so we've got a couple. I'm not surprised. It ended about five or six years ago now. <laughs> Um, but the space shuttle program was the program that the United States used for a long time to send astronauts into space. And you can see it here. The really cool thing about this program was that it was a reusable vehicle where it took off like a rocket, like what you see there, but it landed like an airplane. And so that same one could be used many times. And this is part of what built the International Space Station, which we can talk about at the end because it's very cool. But Something even cooler than just seeing this launch happened while I was down in Florida. I also ended up meeting an astronaut while I was there. This is Luca Parmitano, and he is an astronaut from the European Space Agency, specifically from Italy. And I met him, and I asked him, can I interview you just for a couple minutes? And he ended up sitting down with me, and we talked for almost two hours in which he told me, everything from his experiences to becoming an astronaut towards my dream of someday doing what he had done. And at the end, he gave me his email address and said, I will be your astronaut. If you have any more questions, email me. He also gave me some advice that I would love to pass on to all of you. And it basically boils down to do what you love. He told me that the space agency and the space program was looking for people who are passionate and excited about what they love. And for me, that was space travel. That might be something different for each of you, though. Uh, two years later, Luca invited me to Baikonur, Kazakhstan, which is near Russia, to watch his launch on a Russian Soyuz to the International Space Station. He also then asked me to work with him for uh, his time on sp in space as his Earth liaison to share his experiences living and working in space with different audiences. So what this means is that if you have any questions about what it's like to live in space, to orbit Earth, to be an astronaut, you can ask me 
because I've talked a lot to Luca, who lived in space for six months, and he told me all his answers about what it feels like to eat in space, how it is to work in space, the things that he saw. So hopefully I'll be able to pass on some of those tidbits to you as well. Working with Luca, I started to get excited about education and space outreach, so I um, started an outreach program and also ended up starting a nonprofit. Uh, my nonprofit has now grown to include an audience of over 700,000 people who are following along with my journey online. So if you're interested or if your parents or teachers want to learn more about that, it's the Mars generation, and you can definitely go check that out. We have a lot of cool videos and things that are, um, you know, information about space exploration that you can definitely take a look at. So as I continue on my own journey towards becoming an astronaut and eventually the first astronaut to walk on Mars, there are some things that I'm doing. I'm, like we mentioned earlier, there are a lot of things that are important for astronauts to do in order to, or for people to do in order to become astronauts. One of those is being physically healthy. So I'm involved in a lot of sports. I used to be a professional diver. I'm now a rugby player, an ice hockey player, a runner, those types of things. Who in here likes gym class? Yeah, we've got a lot of hands. That's awesome. No matter what you end up doing in your future, sports and physical fitness are really important. So that's something to hold on to. I'm also currently working on scuba diving. So that's instead of going all the way up to space, it's going the opposite direction. And you get to go underwater and explore things that some people we've never seen before. Uh, I'm also currently getting my pilot's license, which is a precursor towards becoming an astronaut and learning languages. So I speak um, Mandarin Chinese, Russian, English, obviously, and someday I want to learn Arabic. Who in here speaks more than one language? Wow, everyone does. See, you're all already partway towards becoming astronauts if you wanted to in the future. <laughs> but here's the thing is that I want to leave you with a couple messages uh, before I start to take questions. And the first one is that um, education will be your biggest asset in life. So focus on your education as you start to get older. Love your education and most importantly, study something that you're so excited about, something that makes you happy and excited to go to school every day. And that brings me to my second point, which I want to talk about something called the circle of inspiration, which is this idea that you dream big, you act big, and then you inspire others. So you have a dream. For me, that dream is becoming an astronaut and going to space. Acting big on that dream is what you do to reach those dreams. So for me, it's getting a college degree in astrobiology and Russian, speaking languages, flying, staying physically fit, those types of things. But the third part about this is that you can't just single-mindedly go after what you want and what's good for you. You also need to share with your community. So you need to give back, and that's the inspire others portion. A big part of having a dream is that you use it to better your community and to hopefully make our world a better place in the future. So that's what I'm trying to do by being an advocate for education in STEM. And for each of you with your own personal dreams as you get older, that'll take a different path. But never forget how important that is. Um, I invite all of you to be a part of the Mars generation, and that means you and I are the generation who will one day be going to Mars. Uh, and at this point, I would like to thank you for your attention and ask, answer any questions that you might have about my past, being an astronaut, becoming an astronaut, or space in general. All right, let's see up there. That's a great question. So there are a lot of things that I've done in the past. Some of them are, like I said, I've visited Russia to watch launches. I've worked with astronauts who are actually in space to share their experiences living in space with people on Earth. Um, and then there are things like studying. I worked really hard all through high school and now in college to um, hopefully end up with a degree that will allow me to become an astronaut. So that's a great question. Yes. That is also a great question. So the path towards becoming an astronaut is really long. You have to look at this like it's a 20 year path down the road. So for me, that means that the next two years of my life will be spent in college. And then after that, I get to spend another six years in college. So that means that a lot of time I'll spend in school. And that's why it's important that if you do this, it's something that you really love because 10 years is a long time to spend in school. 
but I'm also going to be doing other things like learning, continuing to learn Russian, hopefully learning Arabic, um, getting my private and then eventually my commercial pilot's license, all of those types of things. Yes? Um, I don't think that's quite on Uranus, but there are planets, we think, out there that might rain diamonds. And that's the thing is that there are all kinds of planets that maybe aren't in our solar system where things that we can't imagine are happening. Um, planets that are made completely out of um, just any element that you can Im imagine. There's a planet that uh, perchance is made out of that. That's a great question. Yes. That's also a good question. So I want to clarify something. I am 19 years old right now, and so that means that I've never actually been to space. Darn, I know. Um, so I haven't actually launched yet, but something that I can equate to that is that I fly airplanes sometimes. And so taking off and landing an airplane um, is really an exciting experience. So it's a lot of fun to get to fly. Uh, and sometimes when you're flying, you can do something called a parabolic arch arc. So who knows about microgravity? When you're in space, have you ever, or have you ever seen astronauts when they're in space floating around? Yeah. So the reason that that happens is because there's less gravity in space than there is on Earth, so we're not tied down. And so astronauts can float around. And you can do something like that while you're flying a plane. If you make a shape like this, at the very top, you get a couple seconds of microgravity. And so just recently, I was flying a plane, and I got to do that for the first time. So it felt a lot like being in space. Yes? Um, you know what the moon is really made out of? Because most of the people on my planet currently need their cheese. <laughs> um, I don't want to ruin it for you and say that the moon's not made out of cheese. But <laughs> the moon is, it is mostly, it's made out of rock. So it's um, a lot made out of basalts and other types of rocks like that. Uh, some people think that the moon used to be a part of the Earth and that a really, really, really big asteroid came and hit Earth a long time ago and broke off a piece of Earth and that became our moon. Now that's just one theory about how the moon came to be, but that tells you that it's similar to when you walk outside and you look around and you see dirt or rocks on the ground. I mean, can you tell um, why scuba diving? You didn't really explain why yeah. scuba diving. That's a great question. So I was talking about scuba diving before, and who here knows what scuba diving is? All right, so most of us do, but some of us don't. And scuba diving is when you swim underwater for a long time, sometimes up to an hour, with a tank of oxygen that you breathe out of. So you can go very far down into the ocean. And part of that is that when we were talking earlier about microgravity and being in space and that feeling of floating and being weightless, well, it's hard for us to recreate that feeling on Earth, right? And it's also really expensive to send astronauts into space. So before we send them up, we want them to be trained in how to handle that feeling. Now, who here has been in a swimming pool and has floated on their back? Exactly. So when you're floating on your back, it almost feels like you're weightless, right? Exactly. And so that's one of the things that we use in scuba diving is this idea of neutral buoyancy is what it calls. And it basically means that because the water is supporting you, you feel almost like you are in, um, you're in space and you're floating. And so it's a way that they train astronauts to be able to work in those conditions that are so different from what we lived our entire lives in, which is gravity, to be able to deal with not having gravity. <laughs> yes? What do you know about Halley's Comet? That's a good question. So Halley's Comet is a comet that comes around, I want to say, every about 100 years. And the interesting thing about comets is that sometimes we see comets that only come around once, or maybe once in our lifetime. But there are also comets that come around on a cycle. And that means that they are, um, they're caught in an orbit around our, or within our solar system. And that means that we'll end up seeing them multiple times. Halley's Comet is one of them that you can see every 100 years. So if you live long enough and time it up right, you might get to see Halley's Comet twice. And why Why do all the planets have a distance from the sun? Yeah. 
So that's, that's also a good question. So as we know, the planets are all at various distances from the sun, right? And so you have some that are close to the sun, like you have Mercury that's pretty close to the sun, and then you have some of them that are farther away from the sun. Who knows what a farther away planet might be? Neptune, any others? Pluto, which is now a dwarf planet. Uranus, yep, and Jupiter are our farthest away ones. And Saturn, of course, thank you. So the idea is that when the solar system was forming, uh, the planets that had denser materials, which were the more rocky planets, formed closer to the sun, and those that had more gaseous materials formed farther away from the sun. Um, and that's why we end up having some of those various distances between the planets. All right, boys and girls, we'll do two more questions just so that we you know, make sure we don't uh, run on too long. So that's, so think really hard, I'll do two more. All right, so I'm going to ask you to only raise your hand if you haven't asked a question yet or if a, your question hasn't been asked yet. All right, let's see. Um, right here. Did you know there's more than 100 dwarf planets? I did, and that's something that's so exciting about astronomy and about space exploration is that as we continue to explore farther for a long time, we, we learn more and more. For a long time that we thought our solar system had what? nine planets and now we know that our solar system is much bigger than we thought that it was and it has all these other planets that are orbiting much farther out and now we're starting to see some of those another exciting thing with that is the idea of exoplanets um, which um, our solar system is really big. exactly see when your parents tell you to remember what your home address is you should always add on planet earth solar system milky way to be very accurate <laughs> All right, one more question. So if you have a super important question, raise your hand. All right, in the very back. What were your interests about space when you were little? That is such a good question. Thank you. So what excited me about space when I was little? Well, I used to go outside and I would look up at the stars. And I always imagined what's out there. And so I would ask all of these questions, like what you're asking, things like exoplanets or dwarf planets, or really the possibility of life, so alien life forms being out there. We have this huge, huge solar system and this huge galaxy and this huge universe. And so the idea that we're alone is kind of crazy, and I think that we're probably not alone. I think that there probably is other life within the universe. I'm now studying astrobiology, which is one portion of that is specifically searching for extraterrestrial or alien life somewhere within our solar system or even farther out. That's what really excited me when I was a kid was what can we discover? All right. All right, boys and girls, we're gonna hold your questions and we are going to just kind of conclude things a little bit. You've been sitting very patiently for a long time. You've done a great job. But um, I will do a quick thank you and just a quick summary and then I'll ask one of our students to do a quick thank you and a summary. So I just wanna say that I've been inspired um, by all of the things that this young woman is working so hard to do. And for two reasons, it's awesome. Because one is that oftentimes women um, do not always have the opportunities worldwide to study science at high levels and to go really, really far distances. And it's really impressive and it's really outstanding that Abby's had um, you know, so much passion and so much ability to be able to study the sciences. And I cannot believe the number of things and that she's willing to do to reach her goal. So if you have a goal, it's really important to practice. And one of the things that I want you to understand is how often she would have to practice. How often would you have to practice to fly? You have to put in at least 50 hours of flying time plus many, many hours of book learning. So that means learning all of the important things about your airplane, about how to fly, about how to talk to um, towers to land. It's, it's a long time to learn what to fly. What about scuba diving? Scuba diving, the same idea. You start with book learning. So you start with you know, learning about how to be safe underwater, about all the science behind um, using that equipment, those types of things. And then after that, you start to dive. And it takes hours in the pool to learn. And then you know, it's your continue to scuba dive. And every time you dive, you learn something new. So I've gone on about 40 dives in my life so far, which equates to roughly 40 hours of underwater time. So it takes thousands and thousands of hours to become a professional, to become 
really, really, really good at something, whether you're practicing the piano, riding a motorcycle, doing you know, scuba diving. So what I want you to understand is that practice doesn't make perfect, but it makes really, really good. So that's important. So thank you very much. I've been totally inspired. And again, fitness, fit innovation, all those things play a great role into it. So we're now going to ask one of our great stu uh, students to kind of wrap things up and just do a quick <coughs> thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you for teaching us about space. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. And thank you to all of you as well for having me. Um, you have had some of the best questions that I've ever heard, and I really enjoyed talking to you. And I would like to add um, that I believe that each and every one of you can reach whatever dream it is that you have. Uh, your gender is not a, um, a hindrance in that form. As you can see, women and men can both go out and do great things in science and technology. And even if you don't want to be in science or technology, all kinds of professions are valuable to society. So, you know, you can all go out and do great things. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you.